Cool. Okay, uh, so hi everyone. My name is Luis. Uh, I'm going to start this presentation by uh, talking a little bit about some uh, Elixir and Erlang uh, concepts. And uh, just because it's fun. Uh, and then you'll see why that is important later on in the talk. So the first concept uh, is called OTP applications. OTP, if you're not familiar, is a set of conventions and behaviors that come bundled with uh, the environment in both Erlang and Elixir and all the language that run on the Beam, which is the, the VM that powers all that. Uh, so this is an example of what it would look like. This is uh, called a supervision tree. So there's some processes running and processes that start other processes and then supervise them and uh, whatnot. Uh, OTP applications is, uh, is a really bad name because we end up saying applications a lot and it mixes up with what we also call applications in general. Uh, that's what we have. Uh, the, an application is one of the multiple behaviors that come bundled with Erlang. So there's a lot uh, of others. I'm not going to go into details ab about them, but uh, there are things like gen server, which gives you a generic server behavior out of the box, uh, supervisors, uh, etc. A cool thing that Elixir added to the mix is called uh, umbrella apps, and an umbrella app. Uh, basically allows you to uh, have a lot of these OTP applications bundled into one larger OTP application. So this gives a, it, it's basically a convention, but it, it makes so that tooling it can be aware of this convention. So things like Mix, which is the do everything tool in Elixir, it's build tool, dependency manager, test runner, everything. Uh, Phoenix, which is the web, uh, the web uh, framework, or the main web framework in Elixir, is aware of this and can do different things depending on if you're running a regular app or an umbrella app, uh, and other things like that. It allows you for uh, configuration to have a, a configuration for all the apps. It allows you to have de dependencies shared between apps uh, and stuff like that, all out of the box, which is a cool thing. And the way to start it is, uh, if you were familiar with Elixir, you know like starting a, an OTP app, or a regular app, would be mix new some name, and that would give you the structure for an application, and you just add the umbrella option, and then you have this file structure, more importantly, uh, this one, because th this is the main difference between a regular application and an um umbrella application. In a regular application, you'd have a lib directory where you had then would put your source files. Here, you have your apps di an apps directory that is empty by default, and then you cd into that, and you then create OTP applications in there. Okay, so this is a like, very quick, broad uh, explanation of what OTP applications are and what umbrella applications are. And uh, that will, uh, it's going to become apparent of why that is important later on. My talk is not really about the technicalities about, uh, of umbrella apps and uh, OTP applications in general because it's pretty, that's pretty simple. That's about what I've just shown you. Uh, what I really want to talk about is uh, my understanding of what it means to build a maintainable application. There's a, a lot of frameworks out, out there, and I say frameworks, I come from a web development background, so when I say frameworks, I'm mostly referring to web development frameworks, but maybe this can be more generic than that. Uh, there's a lot of frameworks out there that make it very easy to build an application, but uh, how maintainable is that application is a question that I would like to ask. Uh, at the core of this, of building any application, particularly a maintainable one, in my opinion, is strong communication between the entire team, the, between the team and the business team, or whoever is giving you requirements, the main experts, etc. Um, and some symptoms I've seen uh, over the years that will start to express themselves uh, when this stuff fails uh, are, for instance, uh, you start having very large files. Uh, this is a common problem that happens when your app grows, you start just adding stuff to your files and not really knowing where, where to separate them uh, and stuff like that. This is one of the symptoms. Slower pace of getting stuff out the door. Uh, ideally, you'd like to uh, have a steady pace. So pay the price of uh, in small painless installments instead of have to paying all your technical debt Sometime in the future, you don't know when, and it can be when you least, least want it or expect it. 
Uh, another thing is like high coupling. So that means that most of your components are not really reusable. They're, they are clustered together into, uh, into high coup like highly coupled bunch of, co of components. Uh, this is apparent if you, you start uh, testing them. This will become apparent because testing them will become harder. There's a lot of interactions or a lot of things you need to build to start testing them. With high, cu high coupling, usually you'll also have low cohesion. Uh, that means that your components, classes, modules, whatever, uh, will have a lot of methods or functions that uh, don't really relate to each other. So it's, it means that people just start, started dumping or dumping these functions into the, these buckets. Uh, and now you don't know which things belong to which domain and, and, and things like that. So this is just some of the symptoms I've seen over, over the years to, to, come, to come to this conclusion that uh, for, for me, this is obviously my personal opinion that I'm sharing. An ideal, an ideal application is one that uh, virtual, like air quotes, is easy to understand and easy to change. These are the two, like if I have to make any trade-off, like these are the trade-offs I'm going to make, uh, easy to understand, easy to change. So closely describing the domain, uh, that w whichever the domain is that you're writing an application for, uh, will more often than not lead to a, at least an app that's easy to change. And what I mean by that is uh, we, we've had a lot of uh, talks here about domain modeling and how like, data types can help with this. Like If your, uh, the, the way you've modeled your domain into your code really maps into what the domain is really like, any change will most likely be easier than if it doesn't. And uh, a, a quote that I really like uh, by Chad Fowler uh, is this one. So it's, I think this is a very, very important to have in mind when building any sort of like software, uh, but an application in general, uh, is that what we really want to, and especially when we're getting paid to do something, to write code, like, or, I mean, we're not getting paid to write code. We're getting paid to have a system that works. Uh, and this is, this is a subtle but important difference. Like, if I can have a system that works with zero lines of code, that's exactly what I want. Now, th there's a, a few ways to decouple your code, separate concerns, and kind of tackle all these problems I, I, I've talked about. But the, the one I... I I've been experimenting more with lately, and uh, I want to share is uh, something called domain-driven design. Probably heard of this. This is definitely not new, but uh, it, it's been it's been around for, for a couple of years. But I don't think it's, or not a couple, more than that, for a lot of years. But I don't think it's used uh, enough. I don't think it's uh, as widespread as I think it should. Uh, so I'm doing my part. So uh, this is basically uh, a way of solving problems. That's what the main driven design is. There's uh, some books on the topic. They outline a lot of different things, uh, a lot of different patterns. Uh, I want to talk about some of the concepts, the main driven design, which I'll be calling DDD from now on, just because it's easier. Defines, uh, so it defines a lot of concepts. I want to talk about uh, some of the core ones. So one of them uh, is called subdomains. Subdomains uh, represent something in your problem space, OK? So if you think about it, you, when you're building or you're thinking about any sort of problem, you have a, your problem space, and then you have your solution space. And this is important. This is an important distinction that a lot, a lot of times people gloss over and, or outright ignore. Uh, and DDD creates the concept or explains the concept of subdomains. Here's an example you can have. You can have different types of subdomains. You see there supporting generic subdomains. Uh, there's different types of these things. In this example, we have sales and support. These are uh, our uh, subdomains. Now, when we get to the problem space, then we, we are talking about uh, or what DDD calls bounded contexts uh, or contexts. And these are things that uh, exist in the solution space and define uh, or define an abstraction for your solution. 
we will see more uh, about bounded context. I just here wanted to show that even though they're here they're mapping one to one with the subdomains, so that means that for one problem I have one solution context, that's not mandatory. So here's a more in-depth example of what bounded context can look like. They, they are a theoretically a theoretical or physical even. Uh, you can have them be like different applications in different machines. Uh, but, but they're boundaries of your system. The most important thing about these boundaries, uh, and uh, well, in general, these boundaries are important, especially if you're doing any sort of like microservice architecture or uh, in general, if you, you are separating your uh, system into different modules, it is important to have boundaries. You're going to have to have them, so like how to define them. Uh, I think the, the way DDD does it with bounded context is, is very uh, is a very good one. And the main important thing about a bounded context is that it encapsulates uh, different languages within your domain. What, does, what that means is, in this example where you see sales and support, you see they both have the concept of product and customer. Although product and customer mean, will probably mean different things for sales and than it does for support. And sales will probably care about different properties of a customer and a product than support does. So even though they, they can maybe like say customer when they're talking to you, and this, this can more than something in code can be something in uh, oral communication, when they say customer, they probably are talking about slightly different things. And those, are the, the, those slight differences are the things that are important to model in, into your domain, into these concepts, contexts. So the, the boundary you, you, you set is, when there is, well, one easy way to set this, this boundary is when there is the same name, the same concept, but represents different things, then you have two different contexts. This is a really easy way to understand uh, when you have different contexts. Uh, to uh, drive that point a little bit more, uh, for instance, in, with tomatoes, you have in the culinary context, they are a vegetable. In the botanic context, they are a fruit. In the movies context, they are feedback. Okay, so you have you you can have be talking about tomatoes and mean completely different things w depending on the context you're talking about them. And this uh, happens when we're talking to each other, but that should also happen, uh, I believe, and that's what DDD defends in your system in your code. And the main reason for this is, uh, as Eric Evans, which is one of the main proponents of DDD, uh, says, is that the total unification of the domain model for a large system will not be feasible or cost effective. This means is you cannot really just have one whole system just sharing everything. Like, w your domain cannot be modeled by just one large system. That, that's, that will not, uh, not be cost effective, or you just cannot do it. So you want to break your system into different parts, and this bounded context is a way that DDD has to uh, explain how to better set those boundaries. Uh, now, with uh, umbrella apps, and tying it back a little bit into a less theoretical part, with umbrella apps, and I didn't mention this, but Elixir is an actor-based uh, language with some functional sprinkles. So with, uh, with umbrella apps, they, they really map well to bounded contexts. Uh, a way that I've been implementing them, and I know more people have, is to like, have each of these bounded contexts map to one different application. And within the umbrella app, that, that means, and via the way that the, the VM works, that any communication between uh, these apps, because th they will be in different processes, and by process I mean uh, on VM process, so these are very lightweight processes, they, can, they, they and they have like no shared memory and they communicate via message passing. So that's, that's the only way they, they can communicate. So you or already have out of the box isolated processes running each of your contexts. This is um, pretty interesting. This is very similar to like what you would see with a microservice or service oriented architecture, but there's no HTTP layer in between. There's no like service discovery. Well, there is, but that all comes out of the box in the VM. And this is, uh, all this tooling is, is great, especially for prototyping, I, I think. 
queuing is you already have like each process processes already has a message inbox that it can act as a queue. It can lose some messages, but that's mostly okay for prototyping, and you can postpone the decisions of what message was you want to want. Like, do you you want to use Kafka? Do you want to use RabbitMQ? What do you want to use? And you can postpone that and have your system uh, running out of the box without any of these decisions, which I feel is very cool. Uh, now, again, a, a, bit, a, a more elaborated example of this um, subdomain mapping into bounded context. You can see here we, s we have sales, shipping, and manufacturing. More importantly, sales, you see that we have two contexts. We have a sales context that we are building ourselves, and we have a CRM that's an external service. So we can see that for the same problem, which is sales, the same subdomain, we have, we're using two contexts as a solution. Okay. And each one of these could be uh, a different application. Now, if you have done, uh, as I have done, like uh, use frameworks, MVC frameworks, or typical MVC frameworks uh, like Rails, and I think Play in Java is similar, what, what you have been doing, and that's not necessarily wrong, uh, I still like Rails, you, you've been doing something like this, where you have different subdomains, that, so your problem does not change, but your solution does. Like, you now have one context that's your, in, your app. Like, your entire app is fitted, like, there's no boundaries. Everything's the same thing. Uh, and you'll start seeing that. It's, it's very easy to start seeing that in, let's say, we have sales and, and shipping, and you have a sales customer and a shipping customer. When you start having those kind of namespaces within your models, then you see that you, you're kind of everything's bundled together. That's when you you have this context that uh, is overarching over all or your all your subdomains. Okay, uh, now talked about subdomains, talked about bounded context. Now a bounded context has more stuff inside of it. Those things are called aggregates, uh, which are represented by these uh, ovals here, and Aggregates have themselves entities within them. Now, uh, an aggregate, I'm, I'm choosing this one because it's a more interesting one because it has two entities. Uh, an aggregate can only have one aggregate root. That's one of, the, one of the properties of the aggregates. And the other thing is the aggregates, aggregates exist to uh, preserve some domain invariant. So for instance, in this example, I'm saying that there cannot be more than one customer per address. What that means here is that we don't want to let anyone externally to uh, create an address or do something with an address without going through the customer. Otherwise, we might mess this uh, invariant up. So the, the aggregate, called customer aggregate because the customer is our aggregate root, serves as a boundary for consistency and, and uh, and, trans and, trans and it be should behave uh, atomically. So the aggregate route is where anything from the exterior will make its calls. So they will see a customer. They will not know that an address exists. That's something internal to the customer. So the, or it's basically treated as a whole. This is where um, like actors or in the particular case of Elixir, uh, a gen server, which creates one of these processes, works really well. You can have one of these processes running. It has a public API. And the only thing the exterior world needs is a, its process ID. And then you can send messages to that process and get stuff, in, uh, stuff back, like a customer, an address, whatever. Uh, now. Some of you, or maybe all of you, are probably think, well, this is a uh, duff, right? This is, we're doing a lot of design up front, and we don't want to do that. Well, not really. Like, one thing it's going to be definitely true is that you're not going to get your modeling right the first time. You have to iterate over, over that a lot. Uh, so the, what even the author of the, DD, the main DDD book says is just Try to like have some of these conversations. Try to model it as best as you can right now. Start building something and iterate uh, as much as you can. So there's a, a lot of a lot of talking that's going to happen. 
uh, that's true, and there's going to probably be, be some more meetings with um, the main experts and things like that, but you're, you're kind of putting some of this uh, design up front, not all of it, to save you troubles down the line. That's the idea. Okay, now an another concept that comes from the DDD world is uh, called CQRS, Command Query Responsibility Segregation. Before we look into CQRS, it's important to understand CQS, which predates it. Uh, it CQS basically says in uh, a function or a method, if you have a return value, you cannot mutate state. And if you mutate state, your return type must be void. Uh, in Elixir, for instance, where, um, well, first of all, by mutate state, that means like, it, it, well, it, it depends on, uh, on the language you're using. But uh, an important thing on Elixir is every function has a return, uh, has a return type. Like there's no void. Everything will return something. So what you can uh, abstract is a little bit to say, if you mutate state, you should not care about your return uh, type. So basically meaning that you will have functions to create mutate state and functions to get the state back. So you have commands. These are called commands and queries. And these should be separate functions. CQRS uh, ups that ante and says, you should actually have a different model for each of these responsibilities. These, sh these should be separate entities. Uh, so this is what CQRS looks like, or potentially looks like. There's some client that sends uh, commands to your command model. It can then do whatever. For, for, for instance, it can persist data into a database, let's say. Uh, and then there's a query model that will respond to uh, queries and read that data. So these will be separate entities. And uh, this could even be separate applications in separate, uh, in, in separate servers. It doesn't really matter. That's the point, is that they're completely isolated. And the reason for CQRS is, uh, as uh, the, 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 the person that coined the term, Greg Young, says, it, it, or he claims it's not possible to uh, create an optional solution just using a single model. Like, you cannot create a solution that's optimal for every use case with one model that has uh, commands and queries coupled together. So that's CQRS. Uh, and I'm going to go to event sourcing, which is an, something else that came with CQRS and DDD. It's all kind of uh, a mesh. Uh, event sourcing is not that hard uh, conceptually. Uh, I think most people will have a pretty good mental model what event sourcing looks like if you've been using uh, some distributed version control system like uh, Git, for instance. It's basically kind of like an event sourcing system where you are, you'll have these events, which are your commits, and they append to your uh, event store, which is your, Git, like your repo, your log. But uh, putting this into uh, putting this all together with CQRS and event sourcing and DDD, you can have something like you have a bounded context here. So, and if you uh, think about this as an Elixir app, so this would be an application. You have a command that comes in that will go into an aggregate route. That's a, a little process that's running, waiting for messages. It gets a message with a command. It knows how to translate that command into an event. It persists the event into the event store, which is the single source of truth. Okay, so this is an append, append only. You can think of it as an append only uh, store. Then what that store is doesn't really matter conceptually. It could be a relational database. There's a database that's created specifically for this use case. It doesn't really matter. Uh, and then it broadcasts the event via whatever message buzz you have to whoever's listening, and the, the event handlers that are listening, which are called projections in event sourcing, will take the event, will read the event, and then apply them uh, to themselves, to their model. That could be, uh, again, a relational database that they persist data to. It could be Redis. It could be some sort of in-memory in cache. It doesn't really matter. The important thing is that the commands, so the writes, will come to this thing, and the queries will come to that thing. 
And the way that thing models, so the projection, the way the projection models the data does not have to match the way that the, the context here, the aggregate models the data. So it will get events, and it can model the data the way it wants. It doesn't matter. It's completely decoupled. It can even get events from different aggregates and then match them, put them all together and create like some sort of reporting app or dashboard. It, it, so it's completely decoupled. And by being decoupled, it means you can also scale them differently. You can have them in like, different servers with different servers with different uh, uh, profiles. Okay, that's about it with theory. Uh, and now let's get back to Umbrella Apps, and I'm going to show you some Elixir code. Hopefully, make you happy with that. Um, the library uh, I'm going to show uh, I'm going to show you is called Commanded. It's uh, Li uh, an Elixir library to build CQRS and event sourcing applications. Uh, it, it's not mandatory to use Umbrella apps for this, but that's what, uh, what I've been doing. And what we'll want to build is something like this. Uh, so we have, let's start with the sales part. We have a public API for a sales module that has a place order, place order function that takes a map of some attributes. That will go. That will basically create a command called place order that will be sent to a router. The router knows, and I'll show you the code for each individual part in a bit. Just want to go over what we're going to do. Uh, the command will go to the router. The router knows which aggregate to s to send that command to. The aggregate then knows how to transform that command into an event, and will then broadcast that to whoever's listening. And the same thing. Uh, we could do the same thing for, for, ship, for shipments there. It's this, this, this same pattern then over and over again. Uh, yeah, this is, so this is the simplest pattern. It could be like there's more stuff you can add then, like uh, a command can generate more than one event. You can have uh, events uh, or commands that will go to different routers and stuff like that. But we'll, we'll go over the, the, simple, is, uh, the simple example. Um, one thing... Uh, no, it doesn't really matter. Okay, let's let's go. The public API for sales is something. I hope I hope the Elixir is readable. Um, I don't think you need to understand a lot of it to understand the gist of what this is doing. But please let me know if I'm wrong. So here we have a module called Sales, and the important part is the place order function, which is what, uh, which is basically the public API for our context. And that will re will get a map, and that map will then be uh, will construct. That's what that uh, place order line is doing: is constructing uh, basically a struct with that data, and then dispatching it to the router. Importantly, here is we are generating our own ID. Okay, so that UUID that we're generating, that's going to be important. Now, on the router, uh, we see there, use commanded router. We're basically uh, using the, that's how we get all the niceties from the framework. And it gives us like a macro like this one, like dispatch. We can say like dispatch, this, is this command to order, which is the name of our aggregate. And uh, the important part is uh, the identity there. So the way this thing hooks everything up, because this is distributed, right? is that uh, we have to tell the router what uh, attribute of the command represents the identity of that entity. Okay? So in this case, it's going to be the, the attribute called UUID. And this is going to uh, uniquely identify that specific order across all our systems. Okay? That means that any command uh, that's uh, or any and also any event that's that's going to reference this order, depending independent on the on the bounded context. If maybe some other bounded context is working with orders, uh, they will have to use the same uh, UUID for uh, identity. Otherwise, this uh, the aggregate then doesn't know how to reference the order. Uh, a thing here that uh, that we have because of this is that these identities are not generated by our database. Or they are generated on the, by the application. There's no foreign key constraints, but that's something that we are willing to live with. 
Now our aggregate or our aggregate root uh, ha is basically defines a struct there. That's the the fields or the attributes it cares about, and it defines two uh, two functions, or at least two functions. One called execute that basically gets the current state of that entity, which uh, in this case is an order with an UUID of nil. That means that it's an uh, uninitialized order. And it gets the command. What it does then is generate the event. So you see there, like, it gets execute, gets a placeholder, and generates an order placed event. That event will then be applied to itself. That's the apply method. It gets the state or the current state and an event and it apply, uh, applies it to itself. It has like an in-memory cache of, uh, of the current state. So it, it, it's used basically to do some sort of like some validations on commands or stuff like that. You can have like uh, uh, this internal cache is, is useful. And then you don't see it here. You don't have to uh, worry about that, but commanded will broadcast the, the message. You, you don't really have to do anything uh, particularly uh, about that here, at least. Uh, now, so that that that's pretty much it about the um, uh, about the tra translation of commands to events. The the event can be per well, the event will be persi persisted to the to uh, to the event store, which again can be different uh, can be backed by different storages. But commanders will also handle that when you when you do the execute part. So this execute, the that event will be broadcasted and will be persisted to the event store all automatically. And now on the projection side, on the event handler, uh, again you, you say okay, use commanded event handler, give it some sort of name that's it's going to use to keep track of what events you have seen, and then you say start from, and it has two options, origin or Current, you're basically saying, okay, so I'm a new event handler. I care about all events since the beginning, or I, okay, forget all the events past. I just want events from now on. That then you have, you can have, you will have multiple handle functions, and this handle will match events that you care about. You'll see all the events, uh, but you only process the ones you care about. Here we want the order placed with some sort of uh, UUID, and then we persist the order and re re return OK, and then commanded will return back to the event store with an, an ACK saying, OK, this event has been processed, uh, mark it as processed. Um, so th this is, uh, I think this is really cool, this projection part, because it really allows you to uh, decouple the data you want like to show, let's say you're building an API or you're building a dashboard or a reporting mechanism, like a reporting system, it's completely decoupled from the events. The events are facts, okay? Those happen, those are always there, uh, and you can create these projections, read them, uh, apply them as you want, and uh, also it's, it's pretty cool for stuff like uh, analytics, you you remember like one year past that oh I want to know what happened like with this sort of property you have all the data like that's all stored in your event store you can create now a new a new projection for that specific analytic you or uh, data you care about replay all the events and you have your data this is pretty powerful I think uh, also you can optimize. If you're using, for instance, a relational database, you can optimize this for uh, these projections for the use case that you need. They're going to be used for. Like, there's no need to have a user table that uh, needs to uh, satisfy all the queries possible in the world. You can have multiple user tables spread across different projections with the specific fields you care about. You can opt optimize for like not having joins. You can optimize for uh, all these things, which is pretty cool. Um, so in conclusion, building maintainable apps that scale uh, is definitely not easy. I believe that the straightforward MVC that uh, we have been doing, or I have been doing for a while, is ultimately flawed. It's, it's good in some situations, but uh, even for prototypes, uh, I believe that you are postponing uh, the sort of conversations between the main experts and the dev team and sales and all of that 
that you should have up front, or at least some of it. And uh, this communication, I think, keeps your abstractions in check. So it makes sure that you're not going into, you're not like shooting yourself in the foot, or at least pointing the gun to your foot, and then p possibly shooting it in the future. And uh, as homework, uh, I'll, I'd like to leave you with uh, like wh whatever system you're developing right now, uh, think about uh, if you can draw a dry diagram of the subdomains and the bounded context of that system and how that maps. Um, and if you think you could improve that diagram with some of these techniques, and as a bonus, if you want to implement that with an umbrella app and command it, that's, that, that's uh, great. So this is me online. Uh, that I go by Zamath pretty much everywhere. Uh, I have a newsletter. I don't share a lot of stuff there, but I, I try to share stuff first there if, you wanna, if you're interested. Shout out to my company. We're a consultancy from Portugal. Uh, we do basically anything web if you're interested. And also the, the project we're currently working on, which is called Utrust, a payment gateway in the crypto space. So uh, we're hiring. It's this kind of stuff that we're doing. Uh, it's all uh, Elixir. If you're interested, check us out, utrust.com. And that's basically it. Thanks. <laughs> so uh, I, I know you have some time, but I, I, don't, I don't think I'll take questions here, if, you, if you're okay with that. But I'll be happy to, uh, to talk with anyone if you have uh, any any questions, any horror stories, uh, anything uh, about building these sort of applications? I'm I'm happy to talk to you, and I'll be uh, around for the not very long that's left in this conference. So thank you. <laughs>